So let's get started with the first set of ideas. The idea is that you have a large neural network or you can actually have an ensemble of neural networks giving you a very high accuracy. You train them and during training you can take as much time and resources as you want. Now you want to take that knowledge that your giant neural network or your ensemble of neural networks acquired through training and distill. It's different from transferring knowledge. Now you're distilling the knowledge in a smaller neural network. So let's see how we can do it. A little bit of notation. So let zi denote your logits computed for each class. Basically, these are your scores for the class or each class, and i is denoting the class number. So these are your logits. They are a number between negative infinity to positive infinity. These are your scores. And then we know how to convert them into probabilities. We convert them into probabilities using softmax. But then we are now gonna introduce a new parameter and that's called temperature in our softmax. So if T is one, you get the usual softmax back and T is called temperature. If you increase T, basically if you increase the temperature, you're gonna end up with a softer probability distribution over your classes. And by softer, what do I mean? Can somebody answer? Like more uniform? Exactly. So it's going to be more uniform. So as you increase the temperature, your probabilities are going to be more closer to uniform because these numbers are going to converge to one. These numbers are going to converge to one. The summation over all of your labels is going to be the number of labels that you have. So QI is going to be one over N. And what happens if T is zero? You're going to end up with one class yeah, other than dividing by zero, let, let it be very close to zero, a very small number. If you try to do that, one of your classes is going to dominate. It's going to be a delta Dirac function. And temperature one is what we actually use in practice. But what are we going to do with that? We have a giant network. We already trained it. It took us, I don't know, one month, one year to train that network on a very large data set. Of course, you cannot use that large model in deployment it's not feasible. What you can do is keep generating data from that large model. So these are going to be artificial data. These are not real data. So you can generate a lot of data from that network, the giant one. Now we are going to train the smaller network on the data generated by that giant model. So this is how knowledge distillation works. The smaller model, we are going to call it a distilled model. And the knowledge is being transferred from the giant network to the distilled network. From the giant model, you generate some transfer set. This is gonna be the data generated by the giant network. Then we need to train it, and we are gonna train it with a soft target distribution, basically with a larger T, with a larger temperature. Why do we do that? Because these are not real data. These are artificial data, so we don't want to trust the large network too much because whatever the network is doing, it's not real data. So you increase the temperature, you increase the temperature, generate your transfer data, your transfer set. You do your training, you train the distilled model with the same temperature that you use to generate the data. Once you are done training your distilled model, when you want to do actual prediction and put it in production, you set the temperature to be one. So that's how you distill the knowledge from a giant network to a smaller network. Any questions so far? What does generating a set of data from a model even mean in this context? Do you start with like an indicator function and then back, back propagate and see what kind of image signal would come out of the, like, like when we were doing derivatives and, and back propagation? Uh, no. Once a network is trained, what's going to happen if you input an image, you're going to get output the probability of the classes. So we are going to feed in images. The input is going to be still coming from your training data or a subset of your training data, which you can call transfer set. But the labels are not the true labels. The labels are coming from your giant network, which are just probabilities. The probability of this image being a cat being a dog, being a car, etc. You have 1,000 classes, let's say. But then to get that, those probabilities, to, to get those labels, you are going to use your sub target, which are basically coming from your model with a higher temperature. Does that answer your question? What yes, is the transfer set? 
So it's fair to say that we are just smoothing or blurring the discrete labels on all of the original transfer data or, or excuse me, training data. Yes. Okay. So that's what you're doing. You set the temperature high. Blur, blur out the labels and then give them to a new model and that somehow speeds up or accelerates the rate at which they learn the correct labels again. So now you have some data set generated by your giant network. You take that data set. They were generated by a particular temperature. Let's say temperature was five or 100. Okay. Now you train your smaller network with the same temperature. Once the training is done, you in your production, when you're actually testing your smaller network, you set the temperature to be one again. So here is the process. You train a very large network with temperature being equal to one. Once trained, you generate some artificial data with a higher temperature, let's say 100. You train your smaller network on this artificial data with the same temperature, 100, and then go back in your prediction to temperature being equal to one. Is everything clear for everybody? So Jacob is asking, is the transfer data not the arc max of the output? We are just trying to train a smaller model to have the same soft max with temperature output vector as the large one? That's a great question. So what we are doing is not taking the arc max of the output when it comes to artificial data. You're still gonna keep the probabilities. You don't turn them to actual labels. I think it's gonna get more clear if I show you the math. So the whole vector, yes, the whole vector is fed into the small network as a new label, exactly. And this is really powerful because it's not only a one hot vector that is being passed throughout the training, it's actually the entire probability distribution. If an example has a low score of being, uh, has a low probability of being a cat, still there is some information even if the true label is a dog, but then there is a small probability that's a cat, there is some information there that we are transferring to the distilled model. Something the large network learned, and now we are transferring that to the distilled model. So the message is that the distilled model is even learning from the mistakes of the large model. May I ask one more question? Because what you just said um, kind of yes. relates to what I was thinking. Uh, I was gonna ask if the advantage of this is that it's faster to train a model when you're labels are not one hot vectors. But then maybe what you said actually answered my question is that by blurring the labels, you're kind of using the information of like an intersection of a bunch of different labels to inform yourself even better. Like it's, it's a little bit cat, it's a little bit dog, it's a little bit human. Exactly. So yes, you're right. And then like the, the amalgamation of that information helps you to figure out that it's a cat faster than, okay, that's, that's interesting. Yeah. And that's the role of the temperature. And the temperature helps us uh, more in doing that. You could set the temperature to be one while transferring, but then with putting a temperature to be higher, you're encouraging the lower probability ones to contribute to the learning process of the distilled model. It seems that if you, you would obviously then just erase all the information if you made the temperature too high. So. Yes, so there is a trade-off. If the temperature is too high, there is nothing to learn from. If it's too low, you're back to putting your one hot vectors in your cross entropy. So a number like 100, five, something like that is gonna help us more. And I know that some of you are interested in adversarial attacks on neural networks. We are gonna go to that. Actually, distillation is a way of uh, protecting and making our networks more robust towards adversarial attacks. There are some papers on that. We will discuss them. So it's an important topic. That's why I'm including it here because we are gonna need it later on as well. Actually, there is another interpretation of knowledge distillation. And it turns out that if you try to match your logits, it's a special case of knowledge distillation. Forget about Qs and Ps, your probabilities. You can focus on Zs, the logits themselves, put a regression loss on that, that could be a way that you're distilling the knowledge from one network to the other one. And it's actually a special case of distillation. So it's another way of looking at the same topic. Let's see why. And while I go through the math, it's gonna become more clear what distillation is actually doing. So this is how we are gonna train our network. Previously, QI is the predictions that are coming out of the distilled model. So QIs are coming from the smaller network. PIs, if we were training the smaller model, 
from data, what would PIs be? Can somebody answer? Zero or one. Zero or ones, exactly. So these are gonna be one hot vectors. So only one of these terms would contribute to your loss. But now these PIs are coming from the prediction of a larger model, which has its own logits. So these are never zero. They could be close to zero, but they are never zero. And we are gonna amplify that effect by setting the temperature higher so that we avoid these guys to be zero. That's the role of the temperature. Is that clear? Okay, perfect. That's our cross entropy loss. ZIs were the logits of the distilled model, the smaller network. We can have some logits of the cumbersome model. And basically PIs are coming from VIs in the same way that QIs are coming from ZIs. So QI is a function of ZI, PI is a function of VI using the same exact softmax with a temperature of, let's assume it's 100. Now let's take the derivative of your loss function with respect to ZI. So this is an exercise for you, the derivative of C with respect to ZI. I'm not gonna go into details, but it's gonna be one over T, QI minus PI. So this part I want you to prove. But once you do that, you get one over T, and now we are re replacing QI with the softmax. And if you remember, we were setting the temperature to be the same when we were doing training. So that's coming from QI, this is coming from PI. Now we are gonna do an approximation. If T is big, so let's assume that the temperature is high. What you can do is write down the Taylor expansion for exponential. What is that gonna give you? It's gonna give you one plus ZI over T plus some higher order terms. But because you assume T is high, you can ignore those higher order terms. So that's just exponential Taylor expansion. You do the same thing for the other term. You do it for this term as well. You get one plus ZI over TI, but then there is a summation over your ones. The summation over a bunch of ones is gonna give you N, and that's what you're gonna end up with. So let's try to simplify this formula. To simplify that, we are gonna make an assumption. So far, the only mistake that we were making was that T is high, very high, for the Taylor expansion to work. Another assumption that we are gonna do is that the mean of the logits is zero. And that's not a bad assumption because you can always normalize your data to have mean zero. And if you remember during batch normalization, this is what we were actually trying to achieve. So you can normalize your data so that the logits have mean zero. If they are zero, this term is zero, that term is zero. One and one here cancel, you get one over T squared and then ZI minus VI and one over N is just coming from here. And N is the number of classes. For instance, in, in ImageNet, that's 1000. And T is our temperature. You get the same objective function if this is your loss, that's your regression loss. So with knowledge distillation, you're sort of approximately trying to match the logits. The logits of the distilled model are gonna try to be as close as possible to the logits of the cumbersome model. So is the math clear? This is just to give you more intuition of what knowledge distillation is doing. Any questions? Okay, perfect. So what's the final result then? Your cumbersome model on the MMIST data set is making 67 errors. If you train your smaller network from scratch, that smaller network is gonna make 146 errors. If you train your smaller network by knowledge distillation, your network is gonna make much fewer errors compared to training from scratch. Of course, it's not gonna be as good as the cumbersome model because it's a smaller network to begin with. It has less parameters, it's faster, but then it's much better than training it from scratch. And there is another catch during training. I said, you're gonna train it on the transfer set, which is generated by the giant model. That's true but then you are adding another part of another part of your loss coming from the real data. So this distilled net, you're also training it on the real labels and real data. So it's just the addition of two loss functions. Is there a particular relationship between the architecture of the distilled net and the cumbersome net? The only thing that you need to know is that it's much smaller. Okay. And the other thing that you need to know is that it's the same network as the smaller one, but it's trained differently. And everything is coming from the fact that you are even learning from the ones that the cumbersome model thinks that they don't have much probability of happening. 
yes, it's a cat with a higher probability, with a high probability, but then there are some chances that it could be a dog. So you're also learning from that part of the prediction. And the fact that these PIs are not all zeros, except for one. Does that make sense? So now if you are reviewing this paper, you might say, okay, you applied it on MNIST. Is, this, is your framework general enough? Can you apply it on other data sets? On other data sets, as well as on, on a totally different field, maybe a speech recognition. So the paper did actually that. They did some experiments on speech recognition. I'm not gonna go through speech recognition right now. It's just to tell you that, yes, the method knowledge distillation is general enough to be applied to different fields. You can apply it to speech recognition as well. We are, go we are gonna go through a speech recognition later on in this course or in the follow-up course. But let's see what happens. In a speech recognition, this is the objective that you want to maximize with some parameters. P is your acoustic model. ST is your acoustic observations. And you want to know the probability of the correct hidden Markov model for that particular state, state HD. And HD are just your texts that you are in your training, you are trying to align the speech to text using some forced alignment methods. This is the table. If you didn't understand what's going on there, it's okay, because we are gonna cover speech recognition later on. For now, the big picture is that there is a speech as an input, the output is the text. So you're converting a speech to text, and then you can compare the methods using wor word error rates. How many errors your method is committing per word. So you can have your baseline model that's making this many errors. You can have an ensemble of 10 models. That's the error rate. And you can distill the knowledge in these 10 ensembles into a single simpler model. And that's the number of errors that it's making. So the take home message from this part of the slide is that the knowledge distillation is general. You can apply it on different fields and data sets. Uh, for those of you who want to leave, you are more than welcome to leave. And for those of you who have questions, you are more than welcome to stay and ask. So Omar is asking in this class, will we learn anything about learning capacity? For example, for a given network of, of depth D, what is the theoretical minimum lower bound error it can achieve? So these are great questions and these are theoretical questions. If you look at the title of this course, it says applied deep learning. So for us, it's more important to take a look at the applications. Does that answer your question, Omar? And there are some papers, if you are interested, I can send them to you and then you can see why neural networks are universal function approximators and those sorts of theoretical analysis. I will cover some of that, but not a lot of it, just enough to help us trust our algorithms. Any other questions?